Creek Church. Good morning, Pastor Ryan. Good morning, Kristen. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Good. It's going to sweat a weather today. Or not. It is. It feels good outside today. I think it feels amazing. I know. It does. You have a short sleeve shirt on, though. But you're pregnant, so it's it a great matter. excuse for that. But it's a great day to be here at Stevens Creek Church. Welcome to all of those of you that are joining us online and those that are at South Campus and our Grovetown Campus. We love you guys. Thank you guys so much for joining in today. It's a great day to be here at the Creek. Yes, community. we are so glad that you guys are joining us today. I want to give a special shout out to those of you for, who are here for the very first time. Ooh. Yeah, if there's two ways that you can get connected. One is by grabbing that Connect card mm -hmm. in the seat back in front of you filling it out, taking it to the information center for a gift. Get a cool gift. Or you can text the word CONNECT to 706-222-7123. Real easy. Good Real jingle. Easy. Text it is. that word. It is. So today is our second week of the Armor of God series. Pastor Dave mm -hmm. is bringing a special, special word. He is talking about what the enemy does. He lies to us. Yep. He distracts us and tries to get us away from God's truth. But we're not going to let that happen. No, we ain't. The devil no, is a liar. Yeah, we're sick of him. We're That's not right. going to let it happen. <laughs> That's right. We're going to stomp him under our feet. Uh -huh. We're talking about spiritual warfare yeah. today and how you can protect yourself using the armor of God and using Scripture to fight the enemy back because he has no power over us. Absolutely. I love yeah. that. It's going to be a really good service. I'm excited about it. I am too. On a lighter note, Pastor Ryan. Okay. Have you guys decorated for Christmas? We have. You have? Yeah. We have. How We've many already put trees? our trees up. We have seven trees, and we put the majority okay. of them up before Halloween. That's, That's crazy. how we are. Christmas is all throughout fall, and you know, fall is gone, Thanksgiving's gone. It's just all about Christmas. We decorated the first week in November, which is the earliest we've ever decorated. But Kyle's like, "Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it?" And I'm yeah. like, "Yes, yes. If you get the stuff out and okay. you do it, then we then we can do it." How many do trees it. do you have up? We have one tiny tree, and then two in the kids' room. So okay. Like I heard you had a pencil tree. We have a pencil tree. Never heard of a pencil tree. We got rid of our big stuff. I don't have the energy. Okay. So it's a tiny tree That's with all just right. some gold ornaments on it. That's all right. Very minimal. Okay. I love That's it. That's good. So if you like decorating like we like decorating, yes. we have some opportunities for you yeah, we do. today and tomorrow. And so today after the noon service yep. here at the Augusta campus or South and Grove Town, if you guys want to just hang out after the service, mm -hmm. then you guys can help get things out of the attic. Unload. You can... They're, they're decorating today. There's a lot of stuff to do. So, yeah, we could use your muscles. We could use your time and your effort to be able to help carry some totes, carry yes. some Christmas trees, whatever you feel like doing today, and then tell them about tomorrow. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. at all three campuses, we are starting the fluffing of the trees, yes. the hanging of the lights, the decking of the halls. Christmas at the Creek is a big deal. It is. So it takes a lot of hands to be able to decorate everything. So yes. we need all hands on deck. So if yeah. you have availability Monday morning at 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Be here. We'll probably be going till like 1. Yeah. So if you can't get here at 10, maybe we get here at 11. Yeah, come That's for, enough how, time. for come however long. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Speaking of fluffing trees yeah. and Christmas trees and all yeah. those great things, we have something special that's going on today. It is our Christmas giving tree. So right now we have over 1,200 kids that have signed up to receive gifts, and we have 400 Mo kids that need Mo. to be sponsored. So if that is you, please go to one of our giving trees, our Christmas trees. Take a name. You can you can pick a name and, yeah. and age. There's different age groups. Uh, Males and females, yep. and so pick a tree or pick a pick a name and get a gift for a child. You can also drop gifts off in the giving tree box. Yeah. Is that right? We have um, vehicles at every campus. Yep. Collecting those gifts, you can, like Pastor Ryan said, grab a tag, drop off your gift. Next week, all gifts are due back. So today is the last day that you can grab that tag. So go ahead and do that. Get that gift, and you'll get a free gingerbread, a gingerbread man. man. It's gonna be pretty good. Exciting. So one other thing that we love doing here at the Creek is marking spiritual moments in your life, yes, your children's do. life, yep. your family's life. And so we have two ways coming up very soon that we can do that. Number one is child dedication. Yes. Happening on the 26th. On the 26th of November. Yeah. Yep. And um, this Sunday is the last Sunday to register. It the is. 1030 is already full. So you have the 9 and the 12 to still register for the Augusta campus. And the South and Grovetown campus, 1030 is wide open. So feel free to register there. You go to our Stevens Creek Church website, go to the events page, and click registration on child dedication. Right. Also, baptism, baptism is happening December, December the 3rd. 3rd. So you can sign up for that on the events page as well. Yes. A lot of great things that are happening. There right is now. so much going on here at the Creek. Make sure that you um, go to our events page to get yes. all the details. But right now, we want you guys to stand, stand up, up on your and feet. get ready to worship with Come us. On, let's Let's go.
Well, good morning, church. How many came ready to celebrate the name of Jesus? Come on, put your hands on it. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. You see the mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I find Fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Yes, you do. shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power come on let's see that all over the house let's lift it up oh my yes you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win, you win, you win. Nothing can stand against the power. Everybody, welcome to the creek. I'm Todd. If I hadn't had a chance to meet you yet, so glad you guys are here with us. I'd like to welcome those joining us online today. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Pastor uh, Dave's coming just a little bit. We'll continue our series, The Armor of God. And I know you're looking forward to that. Last week was so great. And I know this week is going to be just as great. So uh, be ready. Get your notes out here in a few minutes. Get ready to take some good notes and be inspired and 
uh, just challenged today. Hey, we're going to sing a few more songs together, but before we do that, why don't you turn to somebody, give them a high five, shake their hand, hug their neck, welcome them to the creek today.
When did I start to forget All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith For the impossible
no one like you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a God that there is nothing that is impossible for you. Thank you that when we find ourselves, God, in situations where the mountain seems too high, where the situation seems too great, when we feel overwhelmed, God, that we can have confidence to know that you are more than able. Not just to get the job done, but God, you are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. That's what it says in your word, Lord. And so we stand upon that today. And we ask that you would just come as we surrender our lives to you, as we come and we worship you and empty ourselves out, God, that you would come and meet us right where we are, right at the point of our need. God, because I know people have come into this place with all different things going on in their lives. They're different places in their spiritual journey, different places in just their life. And God, I know that many are like me and we're dealing with some situations in our lives. And we need you to come and to make yourself known and that if you don't show up in those situations, God, that the things aren't gonna get done. And so we need you to come, God. Come today and heal. God, come and restore relationships today. God, come bring financial needs. Come and meet those financial needs today. And whatever it might be, God, just allow us to know and remind us that you're faithful and that you're more than enough and that you're more than able. So we're thankful for that today, God. So we have reason to come and to celebrate. When we sing songs of hope like that, God, we have reason to come and to lift up our hands. We have reason to come and to clap our hands because you've been faithful in the past. If you've been faithful in the past, you're gonna be faithful again, God. So we just thank you and we give you glory and we give you honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Come on, if you believe he's able, come on, he's worthy of our praise today, amen. Come on. Hey, thanks for worshiping with us today. You guys may be seated. God is more than able. I needed that reminder. Today is a good day. I am so excited to see you all at the creek. If we haven't met yet, my name is Sarah and I'm the pastor on staff here. And I just wanna make sure that you feel welcomed and connected here. So that's what I'm up here to do. Maybe you're hanging out with us for the very first time. I would love to encourage you to connect with us. And we've made it so simple. All you need to do is fill out a connect card that you can find in the seat back in front of you, or you can text the word connect to the number that's on the screen and we'll follow up with you. We just want Want to help you to take your next steps here at Stevens Creek Church. And that can look all sorts of ways, but maybe it's simply getting your family plugged into all the ministries that we have to offer. We've got Creek Kids going on during every service, um, taking care of your children from fifth grade all the way down. We have your middle and high schoolers here on Wednesday nights for our student night. And then we have a young adult ministry on Thursday nights. And so I've actually invited my friend Ashton up here to spotlight our young adult ministry and so I just want you to tell us what is developing. So I'm Ashton. I uh, just came on staff a few months ago. And I knew that coming from college, coming back home to Augusta, I was like, man, who is my community going to be? Because I know how essential community is 
in your walk with the Lord. And I had that in Milledgeville, but it was a question mark coming home just because I'd been gone for so long. And so since being home, I've not only got the chance to lead our college young adult ministry, but I've also been able to just reap the benefits of being a part and being surrounded by other believers and people who love Jesus and being able to just reap the, the encouragement um, and the sharpening that comes with that. So it's been, it's really been just a great few months. From the outside looking in, it's been so inspiring to see this group grow so quickly. So it's obvious that there are other people feeling exactly what you are, a desire for community. So maybe there are people here in the room that have yet to be connected. What are, what are their best next steps? What should they do? Yeah, so we have some young adult specific small groups that meet weekly, but this Thursday at seven o'clock is third Thursday which is our uh, monthly college and young adult service. And it'll be here at seven o'clock. And basically what it is, it's just a service. We'll have worship, I'll give a message, and then afterwards we'll have just a time for fellowship with other people your age. Because I know that it can be hard to get around other people who are between the ages of 18 and 30, unless you're like in school with them, um, because you're not with them every single day like you are at work or or in high school. Um, So it's just a great chance, easy chance to be around other people your age Uh, So again, if you're 18 to 30 this Thursday, it'll be a great, great time. Well, listen, your Creek family is behind you and we are just so excited to see what the Lord is gonna do through you and through this young adult ministry. So let's give Ashton uh, and this ministry a round of applause. So inspiring to see. Well, I have a few other things that I wanna let you know about. First up is y'all are all asking about Christmas. So I have two Christmas announcements for you, okay? The first one, we are decorating for Christmas today and tomorrow. After our noon service, we're doing some heavy lifting, emptying out the attic. And tomorrow at 10 a.m., we're gonna start to deck the halls. And let me tell you, it's gonna be beautiful and y'all are gonna love it. The second announcement that I wanna make mention of is our ladies Christmas party. It'll be taking place November 28th. That's a Tuesday evening, right after Thanksgiving. And I just wanna encourage you all to buy a ticket and be here. We are receiving invitations as you walk out the door today. So that will have all the information that you need. So as you came in today, I'm sure that you couldn't miss the giant Dream Center truck parked on our front patio. We were collecting and sorting all the gifts that you guys have brought in for our Giving Tree initiative. And let me just say, you are a generous church. This this picture, this project is such a beautiful picture of how impactful we can be when we link arms and do and serve this community together. So whatever you give or however you give, the Lord sees your heart behind that. And so I just want to say thank you. Maybe you came prepared to bring your tithes and your offerings today. There's a couple ways that you can give. You can text the word give. You can stop by a kiosk that's in the lobby. If you're here in the room, you can drop your gifts in the buckets when you leave today. Whatever the method though, I just want to say thank you for trusting us with your finances and partnering with us in ministry. So Pastor Dave's coming around and he's got week two of the armor of God. I think you're going to love it. So sit back and enjoy the rest of this service. Hey, good morning, Stevens Creek. Welcome, Grovetown Campus, South Campus. Welcome to you folks just traveling wherever you are, watching online, and to those uh, here in the room at the Augusta Campus. Man, we are so glad to see you. Real quick, before we jump into the sermon, uh, let me camp out for just a minute on one of the announcements you heard, and it's about the giving tree. So one of the best Christmas traditions that we do here at the Creek every year is is help kids right here in our community in in under-resourced situations that might not otherwise get any Christmas at all, and and to come alongside those families and to sort of adopt those kids 
by getting their Christmas and letting them see the love of Jesus in a really tangible way. And every single year, you guys blow me away with your generosity. I love being part of such a generous church, especially when kids are involved. You guys just just step up. And this year, we've got more than ever. There are 1,200 kids in our community that, uh, that are looking to us, to Stevens Creek, to to meet that need. And I think over 800 of those 1,200 have already been sponsored, just showing how amazingly generous you guys are. But today is the last day that, that it's gonna be out there, just with the timeline we have. So if your family could, could take one, or you as an individual could take one, or more than one, we would love to see every single one of those kids uh, taken care of. So just wanna give a quick plug for that, and thank you guys in advance for all you're doing there. So we are back for week two of the Armor of God series. And if you missed last week, we're in Ephesians chapter six, where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. So the book of Ephesians is called that just because that was the original audience of this letter. He wrote to his friends who lived in Ephesus, the Ephesians. They were a church that Paul had started. So Paul had traveled there early in his missionary journeys, and he had led them to Christ and established a church there. That church had grown. Ephesus was a big city, in the ancient Roman Empire, uh, it was a modern city. It was a city that, that was thriving, but it also had a lot of sin, a lot of sexual brokenness, a lot of idolatry, and, and frankly, a lot of the, the same things that we see 2,000 years later in 21st century America. But once those early Christians really got established and, and started following Jesus and living by the word, it changed their lives and it started changing their community around them. And so this was sort of Paul's home church. He had spent years with these folks. But now toward the end of Paul's life, he's under house arrest in Rome, where eventually he's gonna be executed because of his faith, which he's not worried about at all because he knows he's gonna be with Jesus, but he's wanting to make sure that the time he has left on earth is really meaningful. And so he's writing letters to to these people that he's loved along the way to kind of give them some instructions for life. And as he's writing the letter to the Ephesians, he ends it, by saying, listen, I want you guys to be ready for for all life's battles, and I I want you to put on the armor of God. And last week, we talked about what that looks like. I had a football player or a mannequin that was dressed like a football player on stage, and we went through the armor, the helmets like this, the shoulder pads, and the, the, the shoes, what it all represents. Now, the armor of God is is invisible, but it protects us from very, very real battles. And one of the unspoken benefits of the armor of God, this isn't in the Bible, but I think you can do this. Next time you go to the doctor and they have you stand on that scale and the doctor says, you're overweight. Say, I'm not. I'm wearing the armor of God. You just can't see it. It's heavy. I'm in my ideal weight and I'm not taking this off. So you just, you tell that doctor that you're just be, you're spiritual. That's why that number is so high is that you're just spiritual. So God wants us to wear this armor to be ready for life's battles because he wants us he wants us to thrive in life. God has a plan for your life. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to do all that he has accom- he has for you to do. Because life on earth is short. And the Bible wants us to remember how short life is, not in a morbid way, but in a realistic way. The Bible says, "Lord, teach me to number my days so that I can gain a heart of wisdom." In other words, Lord, remind me that I'm going to die fairly soon. But what I'm doing in this life God, whether I've got five weeks left or 50 years left, let it make an eternal impact for you because everything we do in this life impacts eternity. And God wants us to do all that we can in life. There's gonna be an obituary written about all of us someday. And what do you want yours to say? And that's, again, that's not a morbid thought. I think that that's an intentional thought. What are we working towards? What's the life we're trying to live? You know, usually when we're reading an obituary, it's kind of sad because it means somebody's life has ended But every now and then, an obituary can make you laugh. And that happened a few months ago in my home state of Kentucky. A man named James Loveless passed away, and his two sons, who had never apparently written or read an obituary, decided to write their father's. And they submitted it, and the Pulaski Funeral Home in Pulaski County, Kentucky, put it on their website, and it went viral. And millions of people have now read the obituary for James Loveless. And in honor of my home state and all the rednecks who live there, I want to read you just a portion as we remember James Loveless today. You can find this whole obituary online and it is worth your time. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of it. This is just the last couple paragraphs. And I'm going to do it in my Kentucky accent to give it, to just give it what it deserves, okay? 
We don't know if he was married, but he definitely was a ladies' man. There was Kathy, Mary Lou, Tammy, Deborah, Carrie, Tina, etc., etc. It's the bones, he told us, as he proudly pointed to his skinny, pasty white legs. Women love a good shin. We think he might even have some females waiting for him on the other side. Jamie loved his family more than anything else in the world, except for ice-cold bush beer, room temperature bush beer, Team Bones, New York Strip, Prime Ribs, Shrimp, Swimming, Poker, Hatchback, Mustang GTs, Tank Tops, Kentucky Men's Basketball, and his personal copy of Eddie Murphy's Raw. <laughs> he leaves behind his second favorite son, Rocky Loveless, and his favorite son, Rodney Loveless of Science Hill, Kentucky, plus a younger brother, Joey, and an unofficial daughter, Melissa Vance of the Trailer Park, <laughs> as well as his favorite pair of old boxer shorts, which have Buttweiser, King of Rears, printed on the back. He will be moderately missed. Pulaski Funeral Home is honored to assist the family with arrangements. So that's just a little bit about James Loveless, who I never met in person. Sounds like quite a character. James probably, it sounds like he had some good times. But I can, I can bet that, that James probably didn't live up to his full God-given potential of what God wanted to do through his life. And there's going to come a time when your kids or somebody's writing an obituary about you and about me, and, and what do we want that to be? Because God has a plan for what success should look like with our lives. It's that, it's that we, we fought those spiritual battles with integrity and with faith, that we trusted God's word, that we followed him even on the days when we didn't understand what he was doing, and that ultimately through that, God was molding our hearts to be more like his son's heart, Jesus, and that, that by following him, and being part of his family, and bringing as many with us as we could on the journey, that our lives would count for eternity. That's what God has in store for you. That's what he wants for you. And as Paul is writing his friends in Ephesus, these are people he loved, people that he had done life with, and he's telling them, I don't want you to settle for anything less than God's best for your life. Don't fall back into your old way of doing things. Don't get caught up in just what the culture says is okay to do because the culture is broken, but instead continue to love people, continue to to show that radical love and grace that Jesus has shown you, but also know, know that there are gonna be battles. There are gonna be battles that you're gonna fight every single day, and it's the same for us. The spiritual reality has not changed in 2,000 years. It's the same for us. And so these words are true for us as well. So if you're following along in the notes, really the whole overarching point of this whole series is this one. It's that God has given us everything we need to win life's spiritual battles. You already have it in Christ. You have it from the moment you come to faith in Jesus. You're adopted into God's family. You're enlisted into God's army, and he gives you this, this armor that, that, we, that we're supposed to put on every day, and we have to do the intentional work of, of putting it on. Paul writes this section at the last part of his letter this way, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. So last week, we looked at the armor one piece at a time. What does it mean? What does it represent? How do we put it on? This week, we're gonna continue on that conversation, but we're gonna look at the strategies the enemy is using against us in this battle. Because of this point, the next one, winning spiritual battles starts with identifying the enemy. If you're going to a war, you got to know what army you're fighting against. If you're, if you're in a basketball or football game, you have to know what team you're playing against. And then, take it a step farther, you need to know what their strategies are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what they're going to try to do, what's their game plan to get you tripped up. The more you know about them, the more you can properly prepare. So in the very next verse, Paul tells us who our enemy is. He doesn't just say, get ready for spiritual battles, but he says, here's who you're actually fighting. He says, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So Paul is talking about a spiritual reality here. Not not to to do away with the physical reality and the physical struggles they're facing, because these people understood physical struggles. I mean, Paul was being guarded by actual Roman soldiers with actual spears and actual swords. They understood physical struggles, but Paul's saying, these guys aren't our enemy. That's not who our enemy is. They're being manipulated. They're being used, perhaps, by our actual enemy, which is a, a spiritual enemy, because the world thinks all there is is what we can see with our eyes. 
But Paul, having encountered Jesus and having his eyes open to what's really going on, says, but there, there's a whole other world, a spiritual world, one that we will see clearly one day, but in the meantime, for us right now in this world, it's still invisible. And that's, that's where the real battle is happening. It's on a spiritual plane, and we have a spiritual enemy who is waging that war, a spiritual enemy that the Bible calls Satan. Now, when you hear Christians talk about Satan, usually one of a few things happens. It, it, people buy into a few myths about the devil. Number one is that he's not real. It's, it's just kind of, he's a fabrication. That's a myth. Number two is that he's just sort of this cartoonish character, right? He, he wears red tights and he has horns and a pitchfork. And that's not true either. The truth about the devil is that he's way smarter than you and me. He's way more powerful than you and me, but he's no match for Jesus. And because of Jesus, he has no real power over us. However, he'll still do, the devil will still do everything he can to try to discourage, distract, and deceive everyone that he can. And we need to be aware of his game plans. Paul's saying, you gotta be aware of his game plans. So, some people get like, so like kind of spooky with devil stuff that everything becomes like a, a spiritual attack. Like there's a, there's a demon hiding in every bush. Everything that goes wrong in their life, they blame on the devil. You know, it's like, well, you know, I bought a lottery ticket. It didn't win. The, the devil gave me a dud. It's like, no, you, no, that's not how that works. Or I ran out of gas. The devil, he, he just, he drained my gas tank. It's like, no, you, you just didn't pull over when the light came on. Like that's not a spiritual attack. You know, or, you know, like the, the devil is, I, you know, I, I, I felt like I should order this thing on the menu and I ordered it and it was really bad. And I just feel like Satan deceived me. It's like, no, he didn't. He doesn't care what you're eating. Like, that's not how spiritual attack works. But there is real spiritual attack that we need to be aware of because Satan is a deceiver. So here's a brief history of our enemy. He was created as an angel, a beautiful, powerful angel named Lucifer. And Lucifer was actually, even though now it has a negative connotation, was a beautiful name. It means son of the morning star. He was powerful and bright and vibrant and cocky, right? Pride, pride is not only like the foundation of what made Satan Satan, but it's this sin that even now will get us off track for God's plan for our lives faster than anything else, in part because we don't look at it as a serious sin. But the devil... Lucifer, he had pride, and he established the very first civil war in the history of the universe, and he recruited other angels to essentially try to overthrow heaven so he himself could be in charge. He wanted to be God, but God is undefeatable. And so they lost that civil war, were cast down to earth, where one day Jesus will come once and for all, send them to their, their final and eternal punishment. But in the meantime, here, where they still have in, some influence, have you ever heard the expression, misery loves company? Well, they're miserable and they're looking for company and they are good at recruiting and they'll recruit through deception, through distraction, through any means that they can. It started at the very beginning when the first human beings were here on earth, Adam and Eve, Satan was present there in that very first scene and he's whispering there in the Garden of Eden where God had given the first people everything they needed, every opportunity to make the right choice. But to give us, to give us the free will to choose him, he, he gave one choice, just one, one place where they could have rebellion but he hoped they wouldn't. He said, Here's, you can eat from any of these trees, but this one tree right here, don't eat from that one. That's the only place that's off limits to you. Everything else is for you. And so Satan, of course, gets him to focus on that one tree. He said, did God really say, don't eat from that tree? Did God really say? That's still the way that he whispers today. Did God really say? He'll try to get Christians to justify all kinds of stuff that's wrong. Did God really say that, that sex is just for marriage? Because, I mean, nobody really does that, right? I mean, it, if, if he did say that, he's just, he's just holding back on you. He's wanting you to miss out on some fun. Did, did God really say to be generous with money, that all, it all belongs to him, and that the first 10% should be a tie that you bring back to the church, and then you should be generous to others on top of that? Did he really say that? Because you worked for that. That's your money. You, nobody can tell you what to do with that. Did, did God really say to trust his whole word, that all of this is true? Because... I mean, surely a lot of this is outdated. I mean, some of it might be good, but, but surely not. Did God really say? And he's still whispering lies like that. He's still doing it. Making us trying to think that, that God's holding out on us or that we know better than God for what our lives should look like. And when we step out into rebellion, it, it always hurts us and it always hurts others. 
But that's, that's the way Satan works. He is, he's a liar. He's a manipulator. He is a tempter. He tempted Jesus himself when Jesus was walking this earth. And he was, there was a period of 40 days where Jesus was praying and fasting, preparing for his ministry. And, and Satan appears there. And he's very wily. And he, start, he tries to tempt you where he thinks he's got the most leverage. And with Jesus, he tried to tempt using scripture. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. And he'll try to twist it and he'll try to use it. And he'll say, well, hey, Jesus, what about this verse here? Why don't you do this? And, and, and in fact, why don't you just worship me? And, and, this will, and Jesus is like, no, that's not how it works. The Bible says this. You have to know the word to be able to use the word as a sword in this battle. We'll get to that the last week of this series, that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. It's our only weapon in this armor. And if we don't know it, if we don't use it properly, then we're going into battle unarmed. Satan tried to to tempt Jesus. Satan tries to discourage. Satan tries to distract. One name that Jesus uses for Satan is Beelzebub, which means the Lord of the flies. And I love that imagery because as a Christian, again, the, the devil has no real authority over you or power over you the moment you put your faith in Christ, but man, he can be annoying. And what's more annoying than a fly? Have you ever been in a car with the windows rolled up and a fly starts buzzing around. I have nearly like wrecked on the interstate because there's a stupid fly buzzing around and I just can't get it. And I can't think about anything else. I'm obsessed with this fly until it's dead or it's gone or I'm dead. It's like some, one of us is gonna die here, fly. And that's what Satan wants to do. He's, he's got no more power than that fly. But if you give your focus to a fly, it can wreck you. It really can. And so he'll discourage, he'll distract, he'll deceive, he'll distort and we can't let him. We have to be aware of his tactics. Not obsessed with his tactics, not obsessed with him. We don't wanna give him more stage time than he deserves, but Jesus talked about him quite a bit, so we need to as well, because we need to know the kind of attacks that the enemy is going to bring. And here's what he does. The enemy wants to introduce lies and counterfeits to replace God's truth. He's the ultimate counterfeiter. He doesn't want you to settle for real intimacy when he can provide a counterfeit, like pornography, Right? I mean, that's one of his most effective counterfeits in the world today. It's like you don't need to actually be in healthy relationship or, or do the work of, of, of abstinence, waiting, waiting for that marriage someday. No, 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 no. You, you can, even if you are married, you just go over here to where it's an instant fix. It's a quick fix. It's, it's a counterfeit. And it's toxic. And, and Ashley, my wife, Ashley and I, we do marriage ministry full time, actually. And so this is one of the things we talk about a lot because... We do a lot of research. We talk to a lot of people. We know even within the church, this is a huge prevalent issue. It's part of my past story as a teenager and young man that I was caught up in this and I can talk about the wreckage it can bring to your, to your mind and to your relationships. But it is a counterfeit. So many people, so many people are taking the bait of Satan in that issue. And, and I'm saying that today knowing that many here today are caught up in it. And I don't say that to shame you because shame is the devil's game, not God's. Shame is that lying voice that says, you're worthless, you'll all, this is who you are, you'll never be free of this or that. Pride is the other lie, the voice that, that looks at something like porn or any sin and says, well, it's not that big a deal, I can do what I want, it doesn't really affect anybody. Satan will use whichever of those work. If shame works, he'll use shame. If pride works, he'll play to your pride. Jesus does something completely different. He uses what's called conviction. Conviction is like when your conscience feels that sting that says, wait, this isn't good for me, not to punish you, but to get your hand off the hot stove before you burn your hand even more. And says, I've got something better for you. Stop settling for that counterfeit because you're gonna sabotage yourself and the plans that I have for you. Help me, let me help you get free of it. But when we're listening to pride or listening to our own voice, we're gonna think that we're right and that even, even the, the voice of God or even the word of God can't penetrate through our thick skulls and we can miss the point. When Jesus was walking the earth, there was a group of religious people called the Pharisees that thought they had it all figured out. And ironically, it was the religious people who thought they had it figured out that were at odds with Jesus the most because Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He came to make us alive. He came to bring us into relationship with God. He came to change the heart. And and religion is just usually man-made rules of, of people telling other people how they're supposed to behave And that's not what Jesus was about. He came to to completely create a new paradigm. So the the Pharisees were looking at God in the flesh, the Savior, the promised Messiah, and they didn't recognize him. They were offended by him. And Jesus calls them out. And he says this, 
this to them. They're pretty harsh words. John chapter 8, he says, For you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Every, when he was asked his mission statement, Pontius Pilate said, what are you about? He said, I came to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So, so Satan is the antithesis of that. He's the opposite. He is the father of lies. He is, he is the deceiver. He'll use maybe a little bit of truth just to make his lies more cunning and more appealing and more palatable, but everything he does is ultimately a lie. And all of us can fall into that. All of us can be deceived. Every single one of us can. Like, do, do this real quick. Everybody's like looking straight ahead with your shoulders where you are. Try to turn your head to the, to the right as far as you can. You might be looking the devil in the back of the head. <laughs> Just kidding, sort of. But, well, this is what I mean by that. So, so the apostle Peter, right, obviously a Christian, handpicked by Jesus to be a leader. I mean, he's, uh, I mean, we got churches named after him all over the place. He wrote part of the Bible. I mean, a guy that we can just kind of agree, like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he, he, he's uh, on the right side, the right team. But there's a time in the Gospels where Peter motivated by pride and by this other agenda is, is trying to get Jesus to do something different. Like, no, 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 Jesus, you need to do this. You need to do this. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. If Jesus calls you Satan and you're a disciple, that's a bad day, guys. Because <laughs> Jesus says, listen, you don't have the things in mind. You're not thinking about the things of God. You're thinking about the things of man. You're letting pride motivate you're being used by satan in this moment doesn't mean that you're not a christian it doesn't mean you're not saved it doesn't mean any of that but it means that in this moment you're listening to the wrong voice you're being you are being manipulated by the enemy in this moment and all of us all of us have been manipulated at times if, if peter could be manipulated all of us can and that's why we have to be so on guard and i think that being aware of that keeps us humble you know the bible tells us peter was married so i mean i picture in any argument they ever have as husband and wife later in life, when he is like this big spiritual giant, he's like, you know, I'm, you need to listen to me. I'm a big deal. I'm the apostle Peter. And she's like, but didn't Jesus call you Satan? I mean, <laughs> never called me Satan. So the Lord keeps us humble. Now, the Lord wants us to be humble, not humiliated, but humble, because humble keeps our hearts dependent on him. And if we don't lean into that, that Christ-like humility, then pride or shame, the two other sinful extremes, they're going to get us tripped up into falling into counterfeits. And, and this, is, this is one of Satan's biggest tactics, is he will offer you what looks like comfort, what looks like encouragement, but it's really poison. He wants you addicted. He wants you dependent on all the wrong kinds of things. And so if, if you're in a place where, you know, you're, you're leaning into some kind of like quick chemical fix to numb the pain instead of doing the work to get healthy and get connected to God, then you're opening the door for the enemy to just have undue influence in your life that will eventually sabotage you mind, body, and soul. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we kind of had culturally a collective loss, uh, a very beloved actor from the show Friends uh, Matthew Perry, who had a very public lifelong struggle with addiction, he, he tragically died um, way too soon. Now, Matthew Perry just a year ago had a best-selling book, a memoir about his own life, where he was very honest about just his, his ongoing struggle to get sober and to get clean. And in light of his death a couple weeks ago, these words, this self-awareness from him, this is, this is a heartbreaking quote. So Matthew Perry said, one of my big problems and the reason I've had trouble getting sober over the years is I never let myself feel uncomfortable long enough to have a spiritual connection. I would always fix things with pills and alcohol before God could jump in and fix me. So here's a guy that, that understood that he was taking Satan's bait. Like this isn't actually helping me. This numbing that I'm doing when I'm, mis even though the world says, man, you got it all. You're rich, you're famous, people wanna be you. And he, in his own words, was miserable. 
He was lonely, he was broken, he felt worthless. And he said, all I could do to get through that, the moment that discomfort came, I couldn't live with it and I had to numb it. I had to find a pill, I had to get a shot, I had to do something to numb it. But then once I woke up from that numbness, the pain was there and it was bigger than before. So then I had to get more to drink, I had to take more pills. And that is the vicious cycle of addiction. And if you're caught in it, guys, listen, I'm so glad that you're here. This is a safe place for you to recover, for you to get the freedom that you need. You're not meant to do it alone. Satan does his most influential work when he keeps us in isolation. And I heard a psychiatrist say, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is healthy connection. Because every person that's struggling with a chemical addiction, they're almost always doing it separated from healthy connections. Because addiction separates us from the people we love. It it separates us from from that connection and dependence on God. And when we will reestablish those connections the way that God intended, the encouragement and the accountability and the love and the connection that those relationships provide gives us the strength that we need to be on that journey of health and eventually sobriety. But we've got to be willing, Matthew Perry's own words, to be uncomfortable long enough to not have to numb it, but to invite Jesus into that discomfort and to say, Lord, I'm hurting right now. Man, I I, I wanna numb this so bad, but I would rather, Lord, stay with you in this moment of discomfort and allow you to carry me through it, knowing that you're gonna get me healthy on the other side. And he will, he's never gonna leave you, he's never gonna forsake you. And if you still got breath in your lungs, God still has a plan for you. Your story doesn't have to end like Matthew's. It's tragic that his story ended that way, but yours does not have to. You don't have to stay on this path. You can get off of it. And we have, we have resources here to help, to help you get off of it. And a lot of people in this church that have testimonies that felt like they were hopeless and felt like they were too far down that road, but now they're clean and now they're helping others to get sober and they would love to talk to you. So just know, know that you're not alone. You don't have to stay alone. But for all of us, whether that's your issue or not, we're all living in a world where we look around and we just see like chaos and we see negative stuff happening all the time and we see the the evidence of the spiritual attack. And in some days it even feels like Satan's winning. But like we talked about last week, the game's already over. Jesus has already won. If you read the end of the book, it's over. It's like we're watching a football game that's already happened that we're watching on DVR. And even when the enemy scores a touchdown, even when the opposition scores a touchdown on a game that's already happened, you can say, but I've seen SportsCenter and my team wins. We're not losing, we're, we win. But it's still in the moment when you see the, the enemy gaining ground, you think, oh my goodness, what's happening? So God told us, when, that's, when that starts to happen, don't get discouraged. This is just a sign that the end is drawing near and that and in some ways be encouraged by it because Jesus is gonna be coming soon. And we talk about end times prophecy. Usually what people are talking about is like wars and things like this, like wars in Israel. And by the way, I do believe the war in Israel is, is part of end times prophecy and signs of, of, of what God has established in scripture. But most of end times prophecy in scripture isn't about war. It's about what's happening in, in people and in cultures and, and how we're responding and how people are embracing sin on an individual level. So this, this is what I mean. I'm gonna read this passage describing the end times. Paul now writing not to the Ephesians, but to his protege, a young pastor named Timothy, saying, Watch out for this is what is going to happen in the last days. And as I read these words, tell me, is this not dead on what you see every time you open social media, every time you turn the news on, every time you, you just walk out your house, you see this stuff. So Paul says this, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there'll be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. This line, man, this This defines our culture right now. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the very power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So guys, that's, that's our world. And we shouldn't be surprised when we see it. But, but the Bible's telling us don't get caught up in it. Just because the culture is decaying, we shouldn't decay. Jesus says we're salt and light. We should be preserving the culture. We should be standing apart. 
Not in a way that we're looking down on others, but in a way that we're trying to bring them into God's family. Because you remember, people are not ever the enemy. It's not us against them. God wants everybody. He wants us to reach them. It's sin is the enemy. It's the lies they're believing that are the enemy. But what keeps some people stuck and what keeps even sometimes us stuck in unhealthy behaviors and sin and addiction and codependent relationships is whenever you're living in an unhealthy way, somebody is profiting from it and wants you to stay that way. You're addicted, there's somebody that's profiting from that addiction. When you're in a codependent relationship, there's somebody that's benefiting from that. They don't want you to get healthy. In, in, the, in the book of Acts, there's this story of this, this little girl who is, uh, you know, she's a servant girl and she is being influenced demonically. But because of this demonic influence, she actually has this supernatural ability to be a fortune teller. So while she's very unhealthy and while she's being gripped by this dark force, her employers are profiting from it because people will come to her and they'll pay them money for her to like, you know, give them their fortunes or read their palms or whatever. They want her to stay unhealthy. So the apostles, the followers of Jesus come along, they see this oppressed little girl and they set her free. They pray for her like, no, like Satan, get away from him. This is, this is God's kid. Satan, you get away in Jesus' name. They set her free. She's free, she's healthy. You think everybody would celebrate, but no, the people in her life that were profiting from her brokenness are furious because to, her, to them, she wasn't a child of God. She wasn't a priceless soul. She was a meal ticket. She was a paycheck. When you get healthy, there are gonna be some people in your life that don't like it because you're not partying with them anymore. Or you're not buying from them anymore or you're not, you're not running to them in their drama anymore in this codependent way and and. Those people didn't want what was best for you. And if you're a people pleaser, you know, you might have to do the extra work of saying, listen, I I can't live for pats on the back anymore because sometimes those pats were coming for the wrong reasons and I'm gonna have to get healthy. I'm gonna have to create some boundaries because Jesus wants me healthy and I don't wanna settle for anything less. Even if it means some people aren't gonna be part of my life anymore, I'm still gonna love them, I'm still gonna pray for them, but I can't allow their influence here because their influence wasn't doing me any good. All right, we're almost out of time, so let's... Let's land the plane. Here, two bits of good news. Number one, the enemy tries to weigh you down with heavy burdens, but the armor of God is light. Everything God gives you is light. I know I told you that you could tell the doctor that you're not really fat, it's just the armor of God, but the truth is the armor of God doesn't weigh a thing. Jesus says this, come to me all you are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. You'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear. The burden I give you is light. I mean, doesn't that sound good? Jesus is saying, just come home. Satan wants to weigh you down. The world wants to weigh you down. I come to set you free. Just come home. Last one, we've already talked about this. Because of Jesus, the enemy has no power over you. Never forget that. Never give him more credit than he deserves. He has no power over you. Jesus said this, look, I have given you, that's us, authority over us. All the power of the enemy. You have more authority than Satan because yours was given by Jesus. You can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Again, don't let pride puff you up, make you think that, man, I matter because I have this spiritual authority and power. It's like, no, you matter because you're part of God's family. Your, your, your names are registered in heaven. You're part of God's family forever and don't settle for anything less than that. One quick story and we'll wrap up. I think every single one of us is born with a desire for a family that lasts forever. And every desire that you've ever felt in its purest form is something that God intends to fulfill. Now, Satan will offer all kinds of counterfeit for it, but every desire you have in its purest form to co- for connection, for purpose, for whatever it is, for love, it's all from God in its purest form. And we're born wanting to be in a forever family. So a few months ago, our youngest son, Chatham, had this friend over for a play date, and they're both eight years old, and this friend was such a sweet kid. But the whole time they were playing, he was carrying around these two stuffed animals. And I'm like, man, that's sweet, but like eight feels maybe a little old to not put down these stuffed animals. And so I, I, I thought there's got to be a story about these stuffed animals. What's the deal? So he, he set him down for a minute, and I, and I took a picture because after the story, that was really meaningful. So here's a picture of the stuffed animals. You know, they're cute and all that. And I said, well, tell me about these, buddy. You know, what's this about? And, and this kid comes from a, a, a divorced home. 
And I about started crying when he, <laughs> when he said this. He said, yeah, he said, I love them. He said, I, I, um, I love having them together because I call this one Mama Monkey and this one Daddy Bear. And when I have them together, it reminds me of when my parents were together. And I'm like, I need to go in the other room for a second and uh, just get a hug. Um, I mean, the work Ashley and I do for marriage ministry, I mean, that's, that's, that's why, you know, we want to keep families together. But, but here's the thing, that desire that he has, being part of this forever family, it's actually a desire that's, that's much deeper than just a mom and a dad can fulfill, even if his parents never divorce. I mean, it, it's, whether you're from a single parent home or a blended family or, you know, no one in your family has gotten divorced, ultimately the only family that's going to last forever is the family that Jesus invites you into. And that desire that all of us have to be loved forever, to be with someone who's never gonna leave us or forsake us, never gonna divorce us, that's Jesus. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're young, whether you're old, he's the one that's inviting you into that forever family and saying, yeah, you you can have healthy relationships and I hope you do and I want you to, but ultimately the most important relationship you'll ever have, the one that lasts forever, is to come be part of God's family. And that can happen today. If you're here today, you're watching online today, you're in Grovetown today, you're at South Campus today, you've not made that decision to follow Jesus, today can be your day. And again, it's not inviting you into a religion. It's inviting you into a family where you say, Jesus, rescue me, adopt me, forgive me of the way I lived. You paid the price for it on the cross and I received that gift you have for me today. He has got such good things in store for you. So just a moment, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray for those that want to make that decision. I also want to pray for all of us who are going to walk out these doors into a world of spiritual battles that we're reminded that Jesus is with us in those battles. And because of him, we've already won. Let's stand together. At every campus, let's stand together. I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. Father God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for equipping us with everything we need to win life's spiritual battles. Lord, I pray against the influence of the enemy over every person here, every family here. God, we say only Jesus is gonna run my life. Only Jesus is gonna run my family. And for anyone here that hasn't yet made that decision to follow you, Lord, let today be the day that they stop waiting on the sidelines and they step into the huddle. They step into the team, the family. They say, Jesus, save me today. Forgive me of the way that I've lived. Make me into the person I was meant to be. Adopt me into your family. Lord, I give you my past, my present, my future, and I will follow you all the days of my life and into eternity. And God, we welcome the brothers and sisters who reached out in faith today to join your family. That family, the only family that will never end. We celebrate them. But for all of us, God, that are still in this broken world, still have spiritual battles to fight, I pray you'd give us strength, that you'd give us encouragement, that you'd give us peace. You'd help us lock arms with one another and face those battles together, Lord, and stand strong against all the temptations and distractions the enemy wants to bring because we know he has no real power over us and we are so thankful for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Could you give the Lord a hand today? He is so good to us. (laughs) Guys, thank you for being here. Don't forget about those kids out there on the giving tree. There are still several hundred kids who are looking, looking to us this Christmas. Let's not let them down. God bless. We'll see you next week.